John Taylor Bonner, Lives of a Biologist, Adventures in a Century of Extraordinary Science. Chapter 3. Everything Peaks, 1940-1960. In 1941, the spring of my senior year, I received a prize fellowship for foreign travel for the coming summer. Had the war not been in serious progress, no doubt I would have gone to Europe, but I could not even think of it. I didn't realize in at the time but as far as my biological education was concerned, this was a great blessing. I decided to go to Panama instead, stopped off in Cuba on the way back. In my tremendous ignorance, I was totally unprepared for the wonders of tropical train forest. The experience was such a profound one for me that I feel to this day that all budding biologists, no matter how laboratory bound, should be sent to the tropics as part of their basic education. It opened my mind. It was a new world. I had made arrangements to spend most of the summer at the Barrow, Colorado Research Station in the Canal Zone. When Lake Gatun was created as part of the construction of the canal, a small mountain became an island, which was named Barrow, Colorado, because much of it was virgin forest, and because it was an island, the Smithsonian Institution and a few universities joined together to turn Barrow, Colorado into a station for biological research. The location was quite beautiful. The laboratory was built above the boat landing, but way above, so there was a hillside of steps between the two. The spacious ground floor was one big laboratory screened in all sides, which allowed the soft trade winds to a waft through. A rather gruff but thoughtful and kind entomologist named Zarek was in charge and he brought me on the train from Cologne the final lap being across the lake in a small boat. He introduced me to the staff, none of whom could speak English, and I had no Spanish. The next day Dr. Zetek left and I was the only scientist there and was alone for most of the summer, with the exception of a brief visit of ecologist. I had never been alone before, and here I was young and callow, thrust into the life of a hermit in a tropical paradise. I had come there ostensibly to collect slime molds and related beasts, but that immediately went into the background. The stunning garish birds such as toucans, the fantastic trees and lianas, the army ants and the leaf-cutting ants, the monkeys, the raccoon-like cotties, the peccaries, and on and on soon became an obsession. I spent all my time trying to identify what I was seeing by consulting the various books in a small library in the laboratory. <laughs>
in my walk. Each day I would see something new. I spent hours watching the monkeys, especially howlers at the capuchins. As far as I was concerned, the island really was a paradise. At first, it was only paradise during the day. As a child, I had always been scared of the dark, and I still was. Nothing had prepared me for tropical night noises. I had a big flashlight and would force myself to go to the beginning of one of the trails, but I would not linger long. The calls were loud, and with a flashlight I would pick out glowing eyes, glowing eyes of unidentifiable, scary animals. I was not even safe in a laboratory. Bats flew around inside circling about me, and I had to stun them with an old tennis racket as they flew by. There was no tennis court on the island. I decided that was the, the express purpose of the racket. Once a bat landed right on my chest, just as I was getting into bed, it was a new sensation I have no desire to repeat. As I sat reading in the evening, occasionally something would hit the outside screen like baseball. This happened then Dr. Zetek was on one of his weekly visits, and he rushed out, returning with a gigantic, slightly stunned beetle. From then on, I collected them for him. A tree frog inhabited the drain of the salmon shower. It was a species that had a loud call, but the plumbing gave it a megaphone. When in first let loose I had remarkable palpitations that did not subside quickly. Being alone most of the time didn't help, but then perhaps it did, for slowly the fear receded, and from that summer on the night seemed tame. I had to do most of my learning without the teacher. I spent the evening reading Proust, which was perhaps unique way to learn tropical ecology. For a few days there was a visitor, distinguished ecologist of an earlier generation, and he taught me some things, but we spent more time arguing for he believed that the important thing about nature was its complexity, and we could learn nothing from experiments. That was interfering with nature. I remember the high point came when he told me that all of the genetics was bosh because it was done with flies in the milk bottles, which reminded him that in his youth he had earned money as a milkman. I was quite polite about it all, repressing a seething, youthful outrage. I got along very well with the staff despite an almost complete language barrier. There was a breadfruit tree just outside, and I wanted to try eating it. So I asked Rosa, the cook, if I could have some pan frito. She gave me an odd look, and that right I got two slices of plain bread that had been fried. I went to get her, took her out to the tree, and she said, Oh, fruta de pan, and laughed. Then she explained with great care that it was no good unripe, and when ripe, the animals get it. So, I still have had 
breadfruit. But I'm told I haven't missed much. I also took my laundry to Rosa the first week and made all the needed gestures, she said, see, see, and rushed off to bring me a bar of soap and a rock pointing to the lake down those thousand steps. I decided that was a skill I was not in a hurry to acquire, so I would lay my clothes out on the grass just before the daily drenching cloudburst, then let the sun dry them and retrieve them before the next rain. It worked to a point, but I did smell something midwet. Later in the summer I went to capitalist Cuba for a few weeks. Even though my headquarters was the Harvard Botanical Garden in Sinfogos, I spent a good deal of time in Havana, going to Jai Alai matches, drinking beer, smoking Romeo and Julieta cigars, eating delicious sandwiches at Sloppy Joy's bar, and suing wild odds. I have not been back to Cuba since then and have found memories of the special atmosphere of the place. In Havana, the streets and the buildings seemed quaint and Latin, the people friendly and attractive. Everything together made a delightful place for a young man to roam. I remember visiting the state capital, but they would not let me in because I didn't have a jacket. For a small free, for a small fee, however, I could rent one. It was all good medicine for an ex-hermit. Twenty years era, era 1940, 1960, was one of the major change for the whole world for biology, for myself. It began with the Second World War, which had already started in Europe, and we and the Japanese joined in 1941. Almost everyone in the world was affected in some way, and for many with the worst kind of tragedy. During that war, years, biology was rather christened especially compared to physics, but it began to produce huge blossoms after the war. When I was in my late teens, during my last years in school, in my early years in college, I had my first great love. It was a fundamental experience for me, undoubtedly because of its novelty. Nothing in my previous life had taught me to expect that one could feel with such intensity for another person. It hit me like a tidal wave. I realize now that a combination of genuinely li liking a person and all those adolescent sex hormones is quite overwhelming. I thought no one in the world could be as excited and as happy as I was, and that my situation was unique. The young woman, the daughter of one of my teachers, was quite beautiful and intelligent. When I could not understand was why she reciprocated my feelings. How could anyone be that lucky? I was intoxicated and I pretty much remained in that enviable position for over three years. She was also interested in biology, and we had many things to talk about, but after all these years, I can no longer remember what they were. What can I remember is touching one another. 
by modern standards of youthful behavior, we were circumspect. Yet, curiously, it was very satisfying. I don't remember being frustrated because we never bad it. I recall only pleasure in all those delightful but rather elementary things we did. Youth has many disadvantages, and I never minded when the mature years crept over me, yet a first love is something quite perfect, wonderful stepping stone to maturity. I have always felt guilty that it did not end gracefully, for I know I handled it badly. Finishing is much harder than beginning, with all its euphoria. No doubt, we grew apart from one another, which is hardly surprising at such a young age, but that made the disengagement no less easy. My mother was quite aware of the affair from the beginning to the end. She was totally non-committal about the virtues of the young woman. She took no sides. She seemed to look upon the whole thing as something uncertain. No doubt, because we were so young. At the time, I resented her attitude a bit, but in retrospect it takes on the aura of another example of her wisdom. For indeed, the passion ran its course. Later, I met a young woman, also majoring in biology, who seemed particularly attractive. She was taking comparative anatomy, and I would go down and chat with her in anatomy laboratory. My thoughts didn't really progress, but we remained friends, and I remember the moment when I suddenly knew that was the way it had to be. I was walking up the staircase, and I suddenly got rather strong whiff of formaldehyde, and like Pavlov's dog, I immediately saw her face in my mind's eye. Clearly, there were some problems with this relationship. It was not until much later that I met someone who, from the very beginning, had a profound effect on me. I went to a party in Cambridge, sat next to a young woman full of animation and quick wit. We immediately clicked, and to top it all, she had glorious red hair. She was a senior, and I was a first-year graduate student, so we could carry on a blissful courtship far removed from any parental scrutiny. This went on with increasing intensity and joy for months. In 1941, as we were walking side by side in the mist down a Cambridge street, I proposed and was accepted. A happy moment. The next step was telling our parents. We made a visit to Ruth's mother and father in New Jersey, where their anticipatory anxiety was far worse than the event. I had a splitting headache in the railway station on the way down, and I tried to swallow some aspirins without the help of a drink of a water. Mistake I have never repeated. Ruth's father was a wise man, and when I was left alone with him, he produced a bottle of whiskey and kept up the small talk until we had made appreciable dent in the bottle. When he finally paused, it was easy for me to ask him if I could marry his daughter and easy for him to say yes. 
it was the beginning of my great admiration for him. Our visit to New Hampshire to see my parents seemed an even bigger mountain to scale. We went there for weekend bringing an old friend who, poor fellow, was supposed to buffer the explosion, should there be one. My mother had, of course, figured out exactly why we had come, but neither she nor my father had even met Ruth. Ma often told us that if we wanted to know if our friends were suitable, we should bring them home, and then we would immediately know. We were about to face the acid test, bringing our diplomatic friend along, whom we knew they both liked. We had not been there very long when my mother took me to one side to have a little talk. Without preliminaries, she said, I like her very much, and it is obvious you plan to marry, and it's why you have come here. You have my approval, but I know you well enough to know that you will marry with or without it, or that of young, your father. There is only one thing you have to do. Don't tell your father ask for his permission. I felt as though this would be the last time in a Western civilization that a son asked his father such a question. I even had a fellowship that was sufficient to support us, but of course I obeyed. Ma could phrase such a request in a way that left no option. When I asked him, he was pleased with the decorum of the question, but even more pleased with the thought of his prospective daughter-in-law, whom he liked from the very beginning. Because of her, I rose in his estimation. A bit later, Ma had a very nice conversation with Ruth, in which she told her how pleased she was. She also felt she should uh, forewarn her daughter-to-be that all would not be a bed of roses. While I was interesting, I was also very pig-headed. The nice part is that in later years, in her usual way of saying just what was on her mind, Ma would periodically tell me that I had found exactly the right person. After a few months of marriage, Ruth and I visited Dayton, Ohio, and I gave a lecture on my graduate student research. The lecture was arranged by Charles Thomas, the charismatic head of Monsanto Chemical Company, and after the lecture, an Air Force colonel came up to me and introduced himself. He was the head of Aero Medical Laboratory in Wrightfield, and they were looking for a young people like me to do research. That were my army plans. I said I had known and was about to be drafted. He told me to volunteer and then gave me detailed instruction on where and how, so that I could be transferred to his laboratory. There were carefully followed, and soon I found myself at induction center having a physical. My first impression of the army was very strange. Endless line of naked men, everyone with a folder of papers in his hand going from one room to the next, to have every part 
of his body checked and his chart filled in. The only interview with any privacy was with psychiatrist. He looked at my chart, then asked, do you consider yourself normal? Without too much thought, I said, yes. He jotted something down on my chart and called for the next person. As soon as I emerged, I could not resist the temptation to look at what he had written. It said, Officer Material. I suddenly feared for our success in the war. Ruth went with me to the army base when I was to begin my army career. It was not a happy day. It was a parting into uncertainty. The idea that we might soon be together again did not cross our minds. At the base, I was processed, a complete uniform, and all the duffel I would need. The part I liked best was the ancient sergeant who wrapped his hands around your neck as if to choke you, and then yelled your color size to a private who handed out the shirts. I always thought they could use him at Brooks Brothers. It would liven up the place. I went into a large room with many desks and was told that I was to be classified. A burly sergeant asked me that I did. I told him that I was biologist. He began looking it up in a big book in front of him and said there was no such occupation listed in the register. I said I was sorry to hear it because that was my only occupation. He asked me to wait a moment and he returned with another large book and finally found it. Then he asked, are you skilled or unskilled? I said, they didn't rate biologists that way. He then asked, how long had I been during my work, doing my work? After some quick calculations, I said, about six years. He replied, oh, Christ, if you are not skilled after six years, you must be no damn good. So I entered the army as a skilled biologist. My life in the barracks at Wright Field, outside, outside of Dayton, was remarkably pleasant. The majority of the men were from central Pennsylvania, some of them coal miners. They were fine people. But when they got mad at one another, the insult was always, You got them call miner! The best of them all was Master Sergeant Mertz, who had total authority over the barracks and was liked by all. They realized there was something peculiar about me, but they were tolerant and even amiable, provided I wrote the waves of their rather crude humor when it was directed at me. Despite all the rough talk, whenever I got in my kind of difficulty, they were right beside me to help. They taught me many things that kept me in a good stead in later life. My first job at the aeromedical laboratory was to map out the colonel's office. I remember carefully parking my mop outside the door before knocking. I thought I could introduce myself more effectively without holding a mop in my hand. Fortunately, he was not in, but later when I met him in a hallway and said my bit, he seemed totally uninterested. I was not the bright young man he had recruited 
but the menial help. The idea of research was clearly out of the question. My lot was Barak's life, KP in our educational experience, and working in a high altitude chambers in the basement of the laboratory. These were large cylinders the size of airplane cabins with benches inside. They could be evacuated by a pump so that one could simulate any altitude from a ground level to well very 40,000 feet. We were the guinea pigs for testing many different kinds of oxygen equipment, especially masks. If one stayed up at a high altitude for any period, one suffered aches and pains in one's joint. These are the bends due to bubbles of nitrogen gas that form in one's blood. You could feel the bubbles along the vein in the arm. It felt like having rice krispies in one's circulatory system. Bends are easily cured by coming down to lower simulated altitudes. The other problem was having clogged ears when going down too rapidly, a familiar difficulty when descending in an airplane. Some of us had large eustachian tubes which connect the middle ear to the mouth and were considered useful guinea pigs because we could be brought down fast. There were a small number of us graduate students, all of whom were quite cheerfully doing these manual things, but at the same time wondering why we had been recruited by the colonel, who seemed to be unaware of our experience. It turned out that we were not forgotten. We were all rounded up and urged to volunteer for officer candidate school, OCS, for free mouth training course on how to become officer and a gentleman. I agreed, but nearly did not make it because the day before we were to go, our captain, who was our officer boss, called me in to tell me that because of my French, he had just received orders that I was to be transferred to intelligence, and no doubt spent the duration reading other people's letters. Captain Murphy was a splendid fellow who was well liked by enlisted men. Part of our admiration of him came from the fact that his previous career had been in burlesque. He was the good-looking, stride man who introduced the different acts, sang sugary songs in between. He asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I wanted to go to OCS and come back to the Aero Medical Laboratory, for I knew then I could do research. He said, fine. He would put the other orders in the back of his desk and not find them until after I was gone. OCS was a remarkable experience for me. To come under such total regime and discipline night and day had a most curious effect on my psyche. I felt as though I were changing into mindless automation. Shortly after I returned to Wrightfield, I read a book by someone who had suffered in a German concentration camp, and to my amazement, it exactly described my mental separation from the self I knew.
it seemed to me that I not only did everything without thought when told to do it, but I seemed to enjoy the automatic nature of the process. Even stranger, I began to like my bosses. Not because they were nice men, which no doubt some of them were, but because I felt powerless to think anything else. Ruth sensed some of these things from my letters and from me when I returned, but I never wanted to discuss them with her or anybody. Everything was too odd to talk about. There was no permanent damage, but I will never forget the strange experience of following the actions of someone else who lay within me. I was two people in me, and although it was not too apparent to me at the time, I understood it more clearly later. The experience had a perverse effect on me. Many of my fellow inmates told me later that my chair and constant joking about the absurd side of the things made life much more bearable for them. I do not remember much of this. Again, I expect it was automatic. I re remember one bit of sabotage that gives me pleasure thinking about even today. On our very first visit to the athletic field, we were asked to do as many push-ups as we could and to give the number to an officer who recorded it. It dawned on me as the weeks slowly moved on and we spent so much time doing fitness exercises that they were going to give us the same push-up test at the end so they could congratulate themselves that they had not only improved our minds but our bodies as well. I explained this to all my companions and told them to pass the word and especially to be sure to do fewer push-ups when we were tested just before we graduated. The idea spread like a wildfire and we cherished the thought that perhaps the brass would conclude that they tore us down rather than build us up. What reinforced the unreality of the whole period was that all this took place in lush hotels in Miami Beach that had been commandeered by the army. We lived all jammed up in fancy rooms with fancy bathrooms. We ran on the beach among all the glitter. We were in a world that did not exist. We ate in a big ballroom that had been stripped and refurbished in plastic. I can still hear the tunes they played on the jukebox while we ate. And our table manners were supervised. We had to learn how to eat one hand on the table and the other on the lap. This presented special problems with large potatoes, but fortunately it was quite acceptable to spear the whole potato with a fork and gnaw at it as though it was an ice cream cone, as long as one hand was in the lap. Becoming a gentleman took on new dimensions. I enjoyed the classes because for the first time in my life I could get good grades without working. I even spent some time coaching others who were having difficulties. The subjects were satisfying. Army law, leadership, supply, similar practical subjects. The short answer tests were especially puzzling because they seem to have little to do with a subject matter. Often the questions 
were impenetrably unclear, and thus impossible questions would appear more than once on the same test. I finally screwed up my courage and asked the young lieutenant who taught the supply course about all these peculiarities. He laughed and said the tests were prepared by a special unit of educational psychologists. What they did is a cool every two weeks those answers that the bright student answered correctly and the dull students incorrectly. This fortnightly unnatural selection in no time at all produced these incomprehensible and irrelevant questions. When we returned to Redfield in our brand new uniforms and shiny gold bars, looking tanned and thin, we immediately began to do interesting high-altitude physiology. There were some excellent scientists in charge, and we quickly became involved in all sorts of urgent problems facing aviators in combat. It took a bit of adjustment at my first meeting to discuss a project I had great difficulty following what was said. I was sure OCS had ruined my mind permanently. We had to report daily to Washington on our research progress. At first this seemed an impossible task. How could one do something worth reporting every day? The unacceptable alternative would be to say that nothing worked that day. I devised a special strategy. It something did work. If something did work, stretch out the success for at least a week of reports. It gave them suspense, like a serial. I got so good it that I began helping others with their reports, giving lessons on the rudiments of daily report writing. Once I had to write a larger report summarizing a whole series of experiments, my colonel, fine man who was sometimes a bit irascible, being a professor of physiology at medical school and chafing at army ways, sent the report back with a scribble in the margin saying, rare right. I was incensed for I thought the report rather good. I asked the friendly secretary if she would enter into a small conspiracy with me. She retyped the report without changing a word on a typewriter with a different font. I handed it back and received a courteous professorial note thanking me for the vastly improved version. After the slow and frustrating wait to get discharged from the army, I returned to Harvard to finish my graduate studies. The largely descriptive work done during the year before I left the right field was published during the war with much help from CAP. I still have our correspondence about the paper, and CAP shows characteristic concern that I would be upset by the referee's reports. He gave me a lesson by correspondence on how much the first criticism of anonymous referees could cut to the quick and how one must push aside to the harsh way the comments are clothed and pay attention instead to what they are suggesting, for their advice in this case was worth following. His console was a great help when he finally sent the referee's comments on to me.
It has protected me and many of my students from those often brutal blows. The protection is never total, and especially in early days one is vulnerable. I now had to produce a thesis, and I knew that for the first time I had to discover something new. I had to go beyond description. The thought did not make me anxious because I was so deeply involved in the excitement of day-to-day -day research, which seemed to put me into a trance-like state. Because slime molds develop so rapidly, I was able to grow them so that I always had some cultured dishes ready at each stage of their life history. I still have those notebooks, which are small volumes with cramped writing and many sketches of what I saw. The great accumulation of trying different things has paid off in my ways. In many ways, I noticed odd results that I am still exploring to this day. Much more important at that time was that my attempts led directly to the result that gave me a thesis. I decided during the course of this playing in the laboratory that my main object was to find out the mechanism of aggregation of the starved amoeba. It could be seen especially well in the time-lapse film that a sudden signal they all elongated and streamed into central collection points that became the migrating slugs. In retrospect, now that we know the answer, the problem seemed so simple, one wonders how this have been considered a major puzzle. But at the time the idea that cells in a development could be attracted to one another by chemical attraction or hemotaxis was very much frowned upon. This was because a distinguished and forceful embryologist, Paul Weiss, had made some important discoveries with animal embryos where he showed that hemotaxis didn't play a role in some of organized cell movements in the embryo. Cells felt their way along the texture of the surface by what he called contract guidance. Later, I got to know and likewise, and he gave me some useful advice, but he always cautioned me not to be too complacent with the thought that hematoxis might be responsible for aggregation in slime molds. I tried hard to keep an open mind and investigated the possibility that amoeba were oriented by some sort of electrical force or by some interfacial phenomenon happening on the surface between the moving amoeba and the substratum in an attempt to demonstrate waste contact guidance. I even tested the idea that the center might be giving off some sort of ray, because in those days people were still talking, also with considerable skepticism, about mitogenic rays that were supposed to stimulate growth. None of these things worked. All my experiments seemed to rule them out. At the same time, I could not prove chemical attraction either. During the course of this work, I had developed a way to have aggregation occur on the bottom of the glass dish, under the layer of water. One day, to see if a current affected the orientation of the amoeba, I decided to swirl the water very slowly in a circular dish with a bent steering rod over some aggregates. I left the motor running and after some time glanced through the dissecting scope to see what happened. I was really not expecting much and what I saw nearly blew me through the roof. The current had produced an asymmetrical aggregation pattern. 
There were no oriented amoeba upstream of the center. They seemed to be wandering about aimlessly, while the amoeba downstream were perfectly oriented toward the center and moving against the current. In a flash, I realized the attraction had to be by diffusion, and the diffusing agent had been moved downstream by the cur current, like a wind moving the smoke from the pile of leaves in the fall, with no smoke upwind and the smoke trailing long distances downwind. What surprised me afterwards was how quickly I read the message sent to me uh, through that one glance into the dissecting microscope. Instantly, I saw that hematoxis had been proved and that I had made the discovery that would get me satisfactory thesis. I remember dancing about my lab room and punching the air in my excitement. The experience also taught me a great lesson. I had not carefully designed an experiment that would prove diffusion. I had managed it by accident. That and all of other observations I had made told me that the slime molds were in charge, not I. They would let me know their secrets on their terms, not mine. A gifted and delightfully eccentric mathematician who helped me with the publication of these results knew the same thing. He would write an equation, stare at it for a bit, and then, as though I were not in the room, he would say to the equation, speak to me, speak to me. Well, the slime molds had spoken to me. In uh, writing up my discovery that the aggregation of the social amoeba was indeed by hematactic attraction, to unknown chemical given off in the center of the aggregate, I realized I had to give the chemical a name. The group of which those slime molds are members are the Acrasiales, and in Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen there is a witch named Acrasia who attracted men and transformed them into beasts. This seemed perfect for me because the chemical attracted the amoeba and they were transformed into stock cells and spores. So I named the attractant acrazine. As I look back at this early success, I realize that it epitomizes my approach to experimental biology. First, one does the biological experiment to reveal new phenomenon, and then the discovery can be exploited by further, largely biochemical, experimentation. In this case, that means finding out what the chemical is and the details of how it orients the cell. Later, I will discuss some of the discoveries that followed. Let me simply say, here that this early demonstration of hematoxis has led to a large amount of work in many laboratories, including my own. Cap Weston was, as usual, full of encouraging support, and I turned on the heat writing the thesis. This time there was no nonsense, no pure bonner. It had to be Cap Weston perfect. How I slaved, and how he slaved over me. The final result was short, but the main portion almost ready for publication. My final oral exam was a complete letdown, as had been my oral general exam before the war. The reason undoubtedly was an excess of adrenaline and shame at the answering some questions so stupidly. In this final, I felt none of the professors present. 
including my dear Cap, had any appreciation of what I had done, and that all they did was carp. None of that, of course, was the case, but the excess of emotion made an exceedingly warping experience for me. In looking back at that period, I am greatly struck by difference between what we know now and what we knew then. Biology has taken such gigantic steps forward that I feel as though I was a graded student at least a century ago. When I was a student, in many ways, we were still in the 19th century. For the main ideas, the main problems that preoccupied us had already been spread out in the latter half of the last century and the early part of this century. In the study of how animals and plants develop, the main framework had all been laid down mainly by the great German embryologists and botanists in the 1800s. The new and exciting way of looking at things stemmed from Spemann and Mangold discovery of organizer in the nude embryo that I mentioned previously. It led to a realization that there was a chemical communication system and that development was governed by a series of well-organized signals and responses, which were somehow so well orchestrated that ultimately a consistent adult was produced each generation. The idea that development involves such sequence is an idea that still holds sway. The only difference between now and then is that now we are acquiring a clear idea of what these signals are and how they are received. We now are able to uncover the nature of the chemicals that do the signaling and receiving, something that was mostly out of the question when I was a student. I can even remember saying that the identity of the chemical signal was just a detail. It was a principle that was important, words that now seem not only naive, but remarkably short-sighted. The great difficulty for me was that all this splendid early work was written in German, and none of classic papers were less than 80 pages. At the early stage, I asked my Swiss grandmother to help me translate paper on sexuality in unicellular alga. At first she became quite angry. She wanted to know what sort of degenerate things were they teaching nowadays. But I managed to persuade her that the subject was quite harmless. I thought my struggles with Latin, Latin were bad, but German nearly did me in. I not only had to read those papers, but present their results in front of fellow students in graduate courses. Worse, I could not get my doctorate degree unless I passed a German exam. How I slaved! I took courses in basic German and they were agony. I could not even remember words, let alone have a clue on how to untangle a sentence. I had a vocabulary vest with four pockets, each one filled with cards with a German on one side and English translation on the other. One pocket contained the words I almost remember and other words I never seemed to be able to master, and the other two pockets were for words that were somewhere between these two extremes. All day long, at meals in the lab, everywhere, I would keep flashing the cards and making pitifully slow progress. I was sure I would never get my degree, but I did 
finally passed the test. Soon after I went into the army and never saw a German scientific paper for four years. By the time I got back to developmental biology, I had completely forgotten all my German except for opening sentence of Genesis in the Bible, which was not terribly useful. One good thing for me came out of that horrible war. English became the universal language of science, and I didn't have to start learning German all over again. Even though I took all the biochemistry courses that were offered at the time, I always found myself pulled to the biological questions. This is something that has strayed with me also from the beginning I appreciated the great importance of biochemistry and later molecular biology to my own work and to developmental biology in general. In my research, I often tried to link the biological with the biochemical, but always did so by collaborating with someone clever who could fill in for my deficiency. This led to many fruitful joint projects that have been especially enjoyable because of the collaboration. At the same time, I never regretted that I kept my feet firmly on the biological side. There are a number of reasons for this. In the first place, that was the right level for framing the key questions, the problems I wanted to solve were biological problems. And if the answer involved molecules, so much the better, but one must never forget biological question. Another reason was that I was interested in all of biology, not just development, and that included genetics, physiology, behavior, ecology, and above all, evolution. I wanted to be near all those to see how they interconnected, as well as how they were based ultimately on molecules. None of this could have passed through my head in my student days. I grew up forward by some sort of mindless instinct. I did know that biochemistry was at the time the coming fashion, and to some degree I sidestepped it because I had no intention of running with the pack. I was beset by my desire to be independent. All these are more or less rational reasons for remaining a biologist, first, and treating the biochemistry and later molecular biology as secondary. No doubt, the real reason is that somehow biology was my way of thinking, and I unconsciously followed that path. There is no question that there is a power in this kind of 20th century biology and the whole acrazine story and how it has developed over the years a good example. Many years later, I put in a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation and was turned down. I happened to know someone there who was in NSF administration, asked her if she had a clue as to what that wrong. She said she would have a look and then called back the next day to say that my foray into biochemistry seemed awkward, uncomfortable. Please rewrite the grant stressing the biological problem where they knew I would be on a solid ground. I did, and was awarded the grant showing that others knew me better than I did myself. The 1950s saw enormous upheavals in the progress of biology. Genetics first became molecular when Delbruck, Luria, Benzer, and others decided to use viruses instead of pea plants or fruit flies to do genetic experiments. Viruses are not burdened with a cell 
and its complex metabolic machinery. They are parasites of other cells, and therefore they consist largely of pure DNA with a few associated proteins. They multiply very rapidly and produce large numbers of progeny. In taking advantage of these properties, it was possible to do genetics in a fine-grained way on DNA itself. It was in 1953 that James Watson and Francis Crick made their great discovery of the structure of DNA that was the birth of molecular biology. For the first time, it was understood how DNA replicated itself, and from there, much ingenious work was done to show exactly how a particular stretch of DNA, a gene, was able to go on to produce a particular protein. This was the beginning of what has become vast and important scientific enterprise that has had an effect on all the corners of biology. The most recent triumph has been the identification of the entire human genome. It has given us a handle on how to dissect the steps in the development of all organisms, plant and animal. It has been possible to probe inside the cell so that we know the genes for many of those cell components. It is now possible to examine the relatedness between organisms, build ancestral trees, genes for all sorts of behaviors have come to light. Note that in this list we see that molecular biology has become an important way to study many aspects of developmental biology, cell biology, evolution and behavior. One way to comprehend the explosion is in my own field. Since the birth of molecular biology in the 1950s, the number of people working on cellular slime molds has gone from two, when I started, to, well, into the hundreds. And the number of publications per annum has gone from two or three to about 150. And most of them are on the molecular aspects of slime mold development. This is just a view of small corner of what has happened in all of the biology. The number of biologists in general and the number of new journals have been increasing logarithmically since the 1950s. The changes in biology that have occurred since then not only involve advances in the ideas and great new discoveries but also fantastic eruption of new techniques, new miraculous instruments for one's science. My graded student days preceded electron microscopes or the many new types of optical microscopes, cell counters, cell sorters, myriad of biochemical devices such as all the types of chronography to separate mixtures of molecules, gas chromatography to identify the chemicals in the mixture, and more recently, miraculous machinery that goes with molecular biology. I could go on and on. As a student, one summer after the war at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hall, I can remember doing many experiments on slime molds with nothing but basic glassware, a kitchen pressure cooker to sterilize my culture dishes and media, and a hand-operated centrifuge to wash my amoeba free of bacteria. And I thought I had everything. Perhaps the most notable technical innovation that occurred during this period was invention of the electron microscope. One could suddenly see the parts of the cell at a much higher magnification than had been possible. The development of the machine and its use 
were not instantaneous but progressed slowly. One of the early machines was developed by RCA and James Hillier in RCA's Princeton Laboratories pioneered in perfecting it so that it could be used effectively as biological tool. He asked me if I would like to use his methods for fixing and making thin sections of my sly mold amoeba. The result was by later standards incredibly crude and photographs that resulted bordered on the useless, but soon after the techniques were perfected by many laboratories, the emerging results were stunning. Parts of the cell not known to exist suddenly became visible, a whole new microworld opened up. This was followed by an era when the biochemistry of the cell components was linked to the newly discovered cell structures. All in all, the electron microscope became explosive advance. There were other leaps forward in biology during that period. Animal behavior was going through a revolution. I was a venerable subject. It was a venerable subject, but it suddenly took on a radical new life with the ideas and the wonderfully ingenious experiments of Conrad Lawrence, Nico Tinbergen, and Carl von Frisch. They showed that animals have specific responses to specific stimuli, just as in development, and they were able to make the notion of instinct respectable and acceptable. It had been banned from our vocabulary when I was student. There are innate responses and learned responses. This not only led to advances in our understanding of behavior, but made it possible to ask genetic question about behavior, another subject that always flirted at the borderline of taboo. Furthermore, animals, even bees, had remarkably complex behavior, and von Frisch made clear in his beautiful experiments showing how scoot bees could tell the other bees in the hive in the hive, the direction and the distance of a new source of nectar. Conrad Lawrence, the pioneer who showed how birds could be imprinted at an early age to follow their parents, came to Princeton to give lecture some years ago, and he was a wonderful showman. His lecture was without doubt marvel full of bird calls and bird postures, along with wonderful grasp of the mood of his audience. The next day, a colleague and I took him to our perception center in the psychology department, where there was a series of rooms, each of which illustrated optical illusion. For instance, with one eye, one could peep through a hole, and if two people of equal size were in two corners of the room, one seemed a giant and the other dwarf. When we arrived there, it turned out that Niels Bohr, famous physicist, was going to make the tour at the same time. We were all introduced, and Bohr and Lawrence were like two excited children, each looking through the peepholes or standing in corners, having the most wonderful time. After we finished, Bohr asked if we could have some coffee and discuss what we have seen. This was enthusiastically second, and when we sat around in a circle, Bohr began to talk. I should say that Bohr mumbled terribly in a thick Danish accent. He was exceedingly hard to follow, but we struggled, and Lawrence, a brilliant talker, 
kept trying to say something, but Borg ignored him totally and went on serenely with his discussion. I have never seen such frustration. Poor Lawrence was beside himself. After a half hour, it was over and, and uh, none of us got a word in edgewise. It was fascinating to see the two egos clash, each with his own technique of dominating a conversation. In this case, it was a knockout by Bohr. Later, I tried to put together in my own mind what Bohr had said in his monologue, and it dawned on me that his message was, things are not always what they seem. Another way I saw biology change came from teaching. Off and on for 40 years I taught the elementary biology course at Princeton. Not only did I have to expand to new subjects that did not exist before, but often new discoveries meant that what I had been saying was no longer true. That still bothers me, and I was sorry I didn't keep track of the old falsehoods and new truths so that I could send all students bulletins of all misinformation I had given them. A great moment in my life came when, as a finishing graduate student, I was asked to give a seminar in Yale. I assumed it would be a small group interested in development and was struck dumb with a terror when I got there to find out that it was to be before the entire botany and zoology departments to what seemed to me gigantic auditorium. Fortunately, I had brought along the slime mold film that had been the mainstay of a senior thesis and I was able to talk about my experiments that seemed to prove that the amoeba aggregated to central collection points because of the chemical attractant. I managed to get through the lecture without fainting and was again struck, as I had been before, by the question. There was relatively little asked about my chemotaxis experiments, but everyone wanted to know about the organism itself which had such a peculiar life cycle and which was generally unknown at that time. Well, today it is in every elementary textbook. In thinking back about this, I realized that unwittingly I had infected the audience with my own early and almost unconscious fascination with life cycles. Afterwards, tea was served, which I desperately needed and as I was sipping it with a shaking hand, old Professor Ross Harrison, long retired and greatly admired as being the most profound American embryologist, came up to me and said in his gentle voice, Bonner, if I could start all over again, I think I would work with the slime molds. Never has a young man received such a boost as I did at that moment. I finished my doctorate in the spring of 1947. By then I had been under the wing of Cap Weston off and on for six years. I was now his finished product. He followed my progress in later years with fatherly pride, yet as I look back, I must have been very difficult and prickly child. It is hard to strike out on one's own and shake the habit of learning on parental support. I remember his asking me that last year why I didn't consult him more, and my replying what I felt about him as I felt about my parents. There was no end of respect, and if I had been older, I would have added love. 
but I wanted to fend for myself. I wanted to feel independent. Yet with all that commendable desire to be my own man, I know that there is a large amount of cap in me. The way I lecture, the way I write, the way I tell stories, perhaps I would have been that way in any event, but somehow I adopted. When I was a, a beginning assistant professor in Princeton, I was going to the parking lot to get the car when I ran into an admired friend from the psychology department. He asked how things were going and I, and I had to confess I was a bit down. I had just come from biology faculty meeting and we had wasted an hour discussing why one of the graduate students was failing. Everyone had a theory, one more absurd than the next. One colleague had even suggested the problem lay in a Swarthmore honor system. He replied, if I thought that sort of thing is bad, just imagine what it is like in psychology department. This stimulated him to go on and to make an illuminating mini speech about the problems of being graded student. He said that it was a period of one's life where one would normally expect to be totally independent. Yet not only it is not the case, but once professor holds the power of life and death. The result is that the student, totally unconscious of what is happening, will begin to imitate the way of speaking, the way of dressing, and many other subtle ways, the attributes of his all-powered sponsor. It is an automatic defense mechanism that overtakes the student without his realizing it. It didn't occur to me at the time, but after some years I realized that this is exactly what had happened to me. In those days, I could not have imagined to be true for Cap was such a thoughtful and kind person, but now I know that he entered my skin in a ways I could never have imagined possible. By the spring of 1947, all universities had too many students, too few faculty, because of the uh, GI Bill that paid for the vast number of veterans' education. It could not have been better time to matriculate. I could have stayed at Harvard another year because I had my fellowship, junior fellowship that was well paid and prestigious, giving my career early boost. But I decided I wanted to get on with my life. The war had held me back long enough and the family was growing. Ruth was pregnant with our second child. Were there three places that invited me for a job interview? Amherst, Johns Hopkins, and Princeton. I decided Amherst was where I wanted to go, but it was the only one of the three that didn't make me an offer. Princeton was my second choice and it turned out to be the perfect place for me. Fortunately, I have kept the letters offering me the job at Princeton. My acceptance is particularly revealing in that it shows how extraordinarily modest the requirement for doing biological research compared to what exists today. Here is my letter to the chairman. Dear Dr. Butler, I should like to formally accept the position you have offered me in your letter of December 18 as a research associate with a rank of assistant professor at the salary of $4,000. I consider this offer an honor and it is with the greatest pleasure that I accept.
in our telephone conversation on December 27, major questions on my mind were answered. There are a few minor and more material ones that occurred to me now. After discussing when I, was, I would start, I continue. Another question I wanted to bring up was a basic research equipment. You undoubtedly have all I need already, but on the chance that you might not, it seemed wise to list the items of equipment besides glassware and chemicals that I would use constantly. Compound microscope, camera lucida, dissecting scope, autoclave, dry sterilizing over, small incubator, small centrifuge, triple, sick, I'm surprised I didn't put in three P's, beam balance. If those basic items were available, then I could dive right into the research the moment I got there, which would be most desirable. Today, new faculty members could not possibly begin without a large started grant to buy needed equipment involving many thousands of dollars. They would still need the microscope, but also a computer, many expensive devices for the molecular aspects of his or her, another innovation, work, which is indispensable nowadays of one is doing experimental developmental biology. It is possible that a young biologist now has little idea what a camera lucida is. It is a device that fits over the eyepiece of a microscope consisting of prism and a mirror sticking out on the side. If one looks through the microscope, one can simultaneously see the object under the scope and one's pencil on a piece of paper to the side. In this way, one can exactly trace the object, giving its precise dimensions and proportions. Today, one uses all sorts of clever cameras and even time-lapse video attached to the microscope, which makes such operation infinitely easier. Learning how to use a camera lucida took time and patience and, for a good reason, has become a lost art in biology. Not long after I started at Princeton, the National Science Foundation was established and it became possible to apply for grants. This was particularly important if one wanted to hire a research assistant. I applied for what today would be considered a ridiculously small grant and in the letter that told me I was successful, the NSF asked for an annual report in the form of a letter. After the first year, I wrote that things had not worked out very well. I had tried this and that and the other, and nothing had really worked. Can you imagine writing such a letter today? They wrote back saying, don't worry about it. That is the way research goes sometimes. Maybe next year you will be, have better luck. Can you imagine the NSF writing a letter like that today? So with all the wonders and marvels of our progress in laboratory biology during the last 50 years, there is a price we have had to pay. But for many kinds of experiments, it could not be any other way. It may be fun to reminisce about the good old days, but it is far more rewarding to admire the truly extraordinary changes of the intervening years. A short time ago, I was asked what the Princeton Biology Department was like in my early days that compared to today. In the first place, it was small. There were 10 faculty members. I was the 11. Today we number in the 50s and split into two departments. Then it was like joining a club. Now 
it is a professional institution. There were very few graded students, and the undergraduates took to their studies in a much more relaxed fashion than they do today. Reminders of the undergraduate days of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald were still visible, although the more mature returning servicemen were beginning to change that. And there were fewer undergraduate. Everything is larger today. One bit of early excitement was the fact that soon after I began I had a senior and two graduate students doing research with me. The graduate students were a new breed. They too had been in the service and were back at the university just the way I had been only a short time before. So we were close in age and happily got along well. I had told them one day that I had gone directly from back private to officer candidate school and I had always admired master surgeons as the ones with the supreme power. I used an old fatigue jacket in the lab when doing dirty jobs and one morning to my delight I found the master surgeon straps had been secretly sewn on during the night. What more could I achieve? One of the students, and the very first to get his doctorate with me, was David Studler, who later went on to a distinguished career at the University of Washington in Seattle. One day David's father came to visit his son, and I was asked to join them lunch. This put me in a bit of state because L.J. Studler was one of the really grand men of genetics at that time. What would he think of the very young man teaching his son? I should have known better because David's father was indeed the splendid person I had been told about. He had the gift of making one feel that the privilege was his, although we both knew perfectly well it was the reverse. Erwin Schrödinger, What is Life? had just been published, and we had a stimulating discussion during lunch about what it all meant and what it held in store for us. This was a revolutionary book by a famous physicist that in many ways heralded in a new age of molecular genetics. In a slim volume, Schrodinger managed to pose the key question, what were the properties of genes that give them such remarkable capabilities? As theoretical physicist, he only asked the very general question, but his book was a great catalyst that contributed to the explosion that soon followed, first with understanding of the genetics of viruses, and then structure and properties of DNA. In the beginning, I had students working on the development of numerous different lower organisms, algae and fungi, particularly but as my own work of slime molds progressed, I found that more and more of my students wanted to work on them too so that my laboratory slowly emerged into a smile mold lab. There are a number of advances we made during that period that we were rewarding, but let me describe just a few to give some idea of why I became so engrossed. Each year I would have some seniors doing research with me for their senior thesis, along with graduate students and occasional postdoctoral fellows. In the early 1950s, a senior was going to look 
into the orientation toward light of slugs in the migrating stage to see what colors were particularly effective in attracting them. The idea was that in this way one could get some idea of what kind of pigment within the migrating slug was absorbing the, the light and uh, causing the orienting to light response. Years later, this goal was successfully carried out by others and is now well established. My student put the culture dish containing the slime mold slugs in small wooden boxes. In the uh, window was cut at one end. In these windows, he pasted with electrical tape different color filters and placed the boxes some distance from fluorescent light in an incubator. The next morning, it was easy to see the direction of movement of the slugs because they leave visible tracks behind. The only problem was that he found that no matter what color he used, the slug crawled toward the light, which to me seemed impossibly puzzling. He then tried something that would never have occurred to me. He placed the chalk boxes backward so that their light-proof end was toward the light bulb, and the next morning he came rushing in to my office with Erika look all over his face. The slugs still moved toward the light, even for they could not see it. Therefore, he explained to me they must be responding to temperature gradients. He quickly tested this in a few days and was able to show that slime mold slugs are indeed incredibly sensitive to heat gradients. So much so that we were able to estimate that a small slug would turn in the warmer direction if the difference in temperature between its two sides was as little as 0. 0.0005 degree. When I would describe these experiments in the seminars, no one believed them, and that taught me a lesson. If one's results are met with disbelief, there is a good chance that one is on the something really new. I am happy to report that these results were not only confirmed in the 1970s in a novel laboratory using wonderfully sophisticated apparatus, but we went on to show some other genuinely interesting aspects of thermotaxis. Another step forward was the discovery that individual amoeba do not always maintain a fixed position in the migrating slug, but they can and do move about. The first in inkling of this came from making grafts with slugs that were stained with a vital dye. If one grafted a segment from the anterior end of the red slug into the posterior end of the colorless slug, the red cells would move through the colorless cells and end up in front. The fast cells percolated through the slower ones. In itself, this was just a curiosity, but then I found that in a normal development in any one species, there was a sorting out within the cell mass, and the faster cells went to the front end, while the slower ones lagged behind. This was quite contrary to expectation. It had always been assumed that the first cells to enter and aggregate ended up at anterior tip, and the last cells were at the tail end. This sorting out of the cells 
has not only been confirmed by others, but explained by the all, by them as well. The cells, the largest food reserves, are most likely to end up as spores, where the linear amoeba are likely to become stock cells, which makes good sense from the point of view of evolutionary strategy. For the cells rich with food, we are the safest candidates to start the next generation. Much later, my last graduate student showed, before she came to Princeton, that cells that were starved just before they divided and hence replete with the food energy tended to become spores, while amoeba that had just divided when the food has gone tended to become stock cells. Shortly after I arrived in Princeton, we were invited to a cocktail party and I met Paul Oppenheim, charming German philosopher of science, who told me he was very interested in biology and asked me what I worked on. He pressed me. Even though I told him I worked on a very curious amoeba, and when I told him they were a slime molds, his face lit up and he began to tell me all about their peculiarities. I was stunned and asked him how he knew this because at the time even most biologists didn't know of their existence. He said that some years ago in Germany, in 1930s, he had heard lecture by Arthur Arndt, who showed wonderful time-lapse film of their development, and it is indeed a fascinating film. I still have a copy. He went on to say that the lecture was quite extraordinary because Arndt said that the life cycle of these slime molds was so amazing that any materialistic explanation was out of question. It could only be explained by some mystical, vital force. There is no hint of this in Arndt's 1937 paper on the organism, but he apparently felt no constraints in a lecture. After that, Paul Oppenheim and I became friends, he always asking me about my experiments and at the same time trying hard to make a philosopher, logical positivist, out of me. He was a close friend of Albert Einstein and that was the main reason he eventually chose Princeton after they had to leave Germany. One day he called me up and said that Professor Einstein would like to see my film, my old senior thesis film, that he had told Einstein about and would I come to Einstein's house to show it. Of course I said yes and I arrived one afternoon with the film and projector. We had trouble finding a suitable screen, but finally turned wall map of the United States around. We were joined by Miss Dukas, Einstein's formidable secretary. After the viewing, Einstein asked me if I would come in to his study to discuss what we had seen. We talked for some time, and I have always cursed myself for not having written down what I remember of the conversation right away in a Boswellian fashion. I do remember that his questions went to the core of the problem of development, something I had been pursuing all my life. I also remember how kind and gracious he was to me, a very young and callow aspiring scientist, and he had no trouble understanding my English. Occasionally he would stop and think and one of the others would assume he had not understood, so would repeat what I said in German. Each time this happened, he got quite testy and said of course he understood. 
After we stood up and go, I told him, I knew the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, and had once asked him if he had ever met Einstein. Whitehead replied that indeed he had, under the most embarrassing circumstances. Lord Haldane, very forceful man, had invited them both to dinner, after which he escorted them to his study, left them alone, saying they must have so much to say to each other. He told me, both Professor Einstein and I are very shy men, and we had an excruciating time, never of could think of what to say. I asked Professor Einstein if his memory of the event was the same. He gave a warm smile and said, and certainly was, it was very painful indeed. You see, he said, I was never able to understand anything Whitehead had ever written, so what could I say? As we were about to go out, the front door someone rang the bell. Miss Dukas pushed Professor Einstein behind the door, opened it a bit to see who it was. She closed the door, reopened that same some professor, reported that some professor of physics wanted to talk to him. He said, That old fool! Tell him I am busy. During these early years at Princeton, and especially that summer in Dr. Conklin's laboratory at Woods Hall, I began writing a book on developmental biology. I wanted to show that the methods and the ideas of the old embryology could be extended to all organisms, and that bacteria, algae, fungi, amoeba and slime molds, and protozoa did as much developing as animal embryos used in conventional embryology. My book progresses, progressed, and after many revisions incorporating the helpful comments of friends, I finally submitted it to Princeton University Press. I found the whole process of getting the final version ready and sending it to the press tremendously exciting. I always had a great desire to write a book, for reasons I never fully understood. It was sort of... Uh, primitive feeling that a book would be the ultimate an accomplishment. The reader's comments for the press sent me into absolute dither. Each compliment became etched in my mind, and each criticism was a deep wound. After I simmered down, I took all the criticisms seriously, made many changes, knew that manuscript was better for it. Each subsequent step was a magic event. First, the editorial board accepted the revised manuscript. The next, even bigger, thrill was the galley proofs. How glorious it was to see my words set in type. I had seen my prose before in journal papers, but somehow this was different. I went over the galleys for mistakes with loving care, knowing there was little chance that I would see them through my rose-colored glasses. Then the page proves, with the title page, each step was from one cloud to another. The dust jacket came before the book. I had never seen anything so beautiful with its title Morphogenesis and my name, all in bold print. When the first finished copy arrived, it was difficult to contain myself. Over the years, 
I have often thought about my reaction to the birth of my first book. A reaction that was in many ways remarkably childish, yet instead of finding it embarrassing, I still wish that I could respond to things that way again. Experience, despite it was its many advantages, unfortunately makes one jaded. That primordial thrill can never be fully recaptured. Some years later, it happened to me all over again with my first salmon. I was fishing for a trout and a salmon took my fly and was finally grasped many minutes later. Oh, those palpitations. After the book came out, I had the feeling that no one paid any attention to it and that the book really didn't come into its own until 10 years after it was published. I have checked this recently in my files and there is no truth in it. The reviews were quite favorable. It just took me 10 years to relax enough to understand what had been the outside reaction. Perhaps the main reason for that was a partially suppressed conviction on my part that I could not write. At school I had to take remedial writing during the summer. Cap Weston deplored my poor boner prose. The few things I wrote and showed friends were met with comments that clearly implied disapproval. Yet for some reason I was determined to write and the first encouragement came as the freshman at college in compulsory English course I had to take because they said I needed remedial work. My teacher told me sternly that what I wrote about was the pits. All this stuff about the beauty of the woods with the birds singing. Why did I not loosen up? At the time I was reading James Joyce Ulysses. So my next effort was the first chapter of the book on student life written in the manner of Joyce. My grades jumped from D's to A's and my instructor actually smiled at me. I went on taking writing courses. One with Robert Hillier that was particularly enjoyable and even had a poem published in the student literary magazine and two articles on doubtful science in the Sunday edition of the Boston Herald. But I still had inner doubts. So when I read in the reviews that my writing style met with approval, I was stunned. After the Second World War, my father had quite a splendid position in the United States Embassy in Rome. Both Ma and Pa loved the high life of the Corpo Diplomatico. They lived in the sumptuous and elegant apartment in the Palazzo Tarlonia near the Spanish steppes and, of course, knew everyone. Ruth and I visited in the summer of 1949, and I have many memories of a different world. One image flashes through my mind that somehow epitomizes their life and the summer. In a guest bathroom, the tube was out in the middle of the floor. As one reclined in the tube, one looked up at the rather splendid 18th century fresco with cherubs and clouds on the high ceiling. After he finished his tour of a duty there, the State Department asked my father 
to continue, but he decided that he wanted to resume his interest in the writing fiction. Until then, he had written mainly short stories. Now he wanted to try a novel. He and Ma returned to America and eventually bought a house in a small town outside of Charleston, South Carolina, and he began writing in earnest. His first novel was called SPQR, and it had the high life of Rome as its setting. It was an immediate success and quickly operate, op appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. We were overjoyed for him. Here was yet another new career, and again a successful one. He was almost 60 years old when it came out. It was the first of the series of novels, each one of which was a success. Partly not because of mutual acceleration at having published books at the same year, and partly from paternal pride, he and I used to have this wonderful between authors conversations in which inevitably came the question, how many copies of your book have been sold, son? To which I would reply that it was doing very well. It had sold 378 or something of the sort. Then, when I would ask him the same question, we were suddenly dealing in the thousands. Fortunately, it was a bone of amusement rather than contention. We were both riding so high, we were incapable of feeling badly about anything. There was another related incident that occurred later. This was told to me by my mother, who thought it was a great joke. It has to do with who is who. First, I should explain that who is who automatically includes all permanent faculty member from research universities. It was a matter of no great moment. Pa was asked to send material which pleased new author very much, and he bought the volume with his entry in it. To his am amazement and his delight, he discovered his son was there too. This story spans three generations. At roughly that time, our son Jonathan was in nursery school, and one day the teacher asked the children around in a circle what their fathers did. Note that in those days there was no question of what the mothers did. Jonathan reported that Julie's father was a policeman, Jimmy's was the fire chief, Sally's a doctor, and so on. He was telling this to Ruth, so she asked him, what did you say your father did? He replied, I had to tell them he didn't do anything. My work in the biology department at the university was joy from the beginning. I enjoyed teaching and was able to get my research done without difficulty. I was told that at the end of five years I could have a semester off for a leave. And as the time approached, I decided to try and get a fellowship to go abroad. I applied to both the Rockefeller and Guggenheim foundations with understanding that I would take the 
first one that came through. This happened to be a rock failure, so I quickly wrote to let the Guggenheim people know. What I didn't realize was that Rockefeller stipend was alarmingly small because the foundation didn't approve of families going as well. The money provided was enough to support only me, but I was taking root and the children. We decided to go to Paris, where I wanted to work in the laboratory of Professor Faure Fremé. It was a fortunate decision because Monsieur Faure, as he was called by everyone in his lab, was a winner of all fronts. I had admired him for his published work on the development of ciliate protozoa. Ask him if I could spend seven months in his laboratory. I soon found out that over and above his science, he was absolutely splendid person, much beloved by everyone working for him. He was a short man, straight-backed and with a brisk manner who displayed fine combination of charm and wit. At the time I was there, he was 70, but he seemed much younger simply because he had such spirit. We became good friends. It was a rougher father-son relationship, although I could have been his grandson. Quite often, he would come into my room and say, let's take a little walk, which meant taking a stroll around the circular hallway. He had many photographs of friends and fellow scientists lining the wall and we had a mutual acquaintance, Lake Hodley, my professor of embryology who had worked with Faure some years before and thus youthful photograph was among them. He would stop and point to it and say with a great smile, Oh, voila, la hodley, quid est beau? And then we would proceed on our walk and talk as for there had been no interruption. Faure had no children of his own. Madame Faure and her sister kept house for him. They were the daughters of his predecessor at the Collège de France, and they always seemed to me like a too kindly but rather sharp old spinster. He had a keen eye out for a pretty woman, but in non-threatening way. A number of the laboratory assistants were knockouts, and he referred to them as a nepeti. They adored him, as did everyone else. One day I knocked on his door and he immediately said, Entre. I opened the door and there he was beaming at me with his arm around and snuggled up to one of his petit, who beamed at me too. There was absolutely no embarrassment. It could not have happen in an American or a British laboratory. There was certainly nothing much about him. Furthermore, he was a very modest man. He never mentioned the fact that he was the composer for Rias song, the grandson of sculpture Fremier and the nephew of Sally Prudmont. Once when I remarked on an elegant drawing of protozoan he had made. He explained that he had wanted to be an artist as well as biologist, but his grandfather told him very firmly he must make up his mind. He could not be both. I had wanted to work with him because he too was interested in the development of lower forms.
In his case, it was with ciliate protozoa, such as paramecium, with which he had made some important and interesting discoveries on how they developed, and especially how their complicated cortex with its cilia and reticulated structures reorganized of the cell division. It seemed to me at the time that it would be valuable for me to work for a while on an organism that was quite different from my own, otherwise I might get a distorted, slime-old view of the world. I realize now that my decision also probably reflected my deep-seated fascination with life cycles. Ciliatus were often very large, yet they were single cells. How could they be both? The answer was a very interesting one. They do all sorts of strange things, both with their nuclei and the outside covering of their cells to make it happen. Their life cycle was as odd as that of slime molds, yet also totally different from that of most animals and plants. It turned out to be a good decision from many points of view. In particular, I greatly expanded my understanding of how and why organisms develop. As I look back over my years as biologist, I can see that beginning with my exposure to lower forms of cap restaurants course in my freshman year, in the algae course of Woods Hall and into my early research on slime molds, I became increasingly fixated and fascinated by the fact that not only do all organisms have life cycles, but the variety of these cycles is immense. There was no conscious plan on my part to lay out a program of study along these lines. It just developed within me as though I had been programmed by unknown forces. There is no doubt that all biologists gain much by becoming intimately knowledgeable about one organism, and the slime molds certainly have played this role in my life. But more than that, they have forced me seemingly without premeditation of my, on my part to look at other organisms in a parallel way. My first step in this direction was this foray into ciliates. Working in Faure's laboratory provided me with unrelated and unexpected new lesson. I had to make some microscope slides of my ciliates, and Monsieur Faure said he would get one of his petit to teach me. My first difficulty was that I had written the whole procedure down, and when I followed it slavishly, the results were not very good. My coach told me that was not quite the way to go about it, and in half the time she would get a perfect result. This went back and forth for some time, and I finally realized she was approaching the technique as an art, while I thought of it as exact science. Furthermore, hers was the art of French cooking, while well, I had been brought up in the American tradition directly inherited from 19th century German laboratory. The tradition of precise measurements. I was also taught how to keep my ciliate cultures. Take about so much wheat grains in the palm of one's hand and add about so much pond water and boil for about 10 minutes. It worked perfectly. 
I got so that I was sure I had carefully measured the amount. Everything would die. Laboratory science was an art. I can think of another example that told the same story. I visited laboratory where there was a charming old man who was a direct descendant from Louis Pasteur Laboratory. He wore a black skull cap, the kind Pasteur wore in uh, some of the old pictures. I told of a friend of my visit and he said he had made a similar one and he asked the man how he grew some bacterium that was hard to culture. The answer was that he grew in an agar that was legatement maltose, which roughly translates as lightly melted. Clearly, in France, first-rate science can go hand in hand with marvelous cuisine. Finding a place to live in Paris, we had been told, was impossible. Long before we left, I had sent out innumerable letters with no results. I mentioned our predicament at a cocktail party in Princeton, and someone said to me they had American friends who were just vacating an apartment in Paris, and I should get in touch with them. I did so immediately, and in a time, no time at all, we had the perfect place on the Rue de Bourgeon. Halfway between the Rodin Museum and the Chambre des Deputies, which is in a beautiful part of the city. Not only that, but it came with Marguerite, who turned out to be a splendid person and fantastic cook. We never had, nor will we ever again, cat so splendidly as we did that time in Paris. The irony was that because the Rockefeller no family policy, we had never been quite so short of money. We lived like a royal family, yet we had to have a daily evening conference, pouring over our small collection of francs to, to decide what we could and could not afford to do the next day. I got paid every two weeks. I would have to go across town to the Paris Rockefeller office, where the cashier would hand me a wad of the bills held together with striped pin. In a sort of anxious manner, he would ask me how we were managing. I soon realized that since I had broken the no family rule, he was always hoping I would say we were starving. To play the game, each time I would assure him we were managing famously. By the time we had our third child, Jeremy Toddler still in diapers. Marguerite referred to him as a mon petit crapaud, as crawled above the floor. The diapers presented one of our first domestic crises. The first week I took them down to the Land laundromat and the only way they could estimate the price was by weighing them. I pointed out that dirty diapers were bound to be wet and heavy. Surely I could count them out. No luck. The first load cost a fortune. At the rate we would indeed soon be starving. To solve the problem before going to the laundromat, I would put the rinsed out diapers on the roof outside 
the dormer window. They looked rather like drying codfish in Newfoundland. The older children then to the local school, the Ecole Maternelle, where they learned French remarkably quickly. Jonathan, the five, was picked on a quite a bit because he did not cotton to the fact that the teacher believed the first child who snitched. Every day there were wild tales of class. Marie Francoise stole my gum eraser, so I soaked her, and she told the teacher, so I got put in a corner. Rebecca, then 11, discovered the English Lending Library and the Red Nonstop Loving Every Moment. We hired a woman to take children out in the afternoon. She was an attractive woman in her 40s who must have been ravishing in her youth. She was quite brainless, but the children liked her and they referred to her as Madame Olala. The only person who disapproved was Marguerite. The babysitter had said that then younger she was an artist, and the Marguerite would shake her head and say in dark tones, you know what that means. We took many excursions and we were busy sightseers. All this as the whole family, Saint Chapel etched in my mind. I was carrying Jeremy and suddenly discovered if he let out a baby who it echoed. I had never heard such racket, but much so to our embarrassment and amusement of some of the other visitors. Our one beautiful day we were revealing the park of Versailles. For some time I had been furious with the stroller we had brought from Princeton. It was a piece of junk that kept breaking down. In the garden near us I saw a man with ideal stroller with a large uh, sturdy wheels. I rushed over to him and asked him in my best French where he had bought it. He smiled, replied in his best American that it came from Marshall Fields in Chicago. My youngest brother, Tony, and his wife Eve, whom we met for the first time, were living in Paris. They were both beginning expatriates. Eve had been studying at the Sorbonne when they met, and the Tony was doing music composition under Nadia Boulanger. From the very beginning, it was wonderful to have them there, for we all got along famously. They were great experts on both ancient monuments and museums to visit. And even better, by careful research, they knew all the best cheap restaurants. The Tony, furthermore, would tell us exactly what to order. They greeted us when we first arrived in January, frozen and starved, and took us to a teeny restaurant and told us to order Tarandos and the Amarnak sauce. Whose taste I can remember to this day. The restaurant was kept warm by a glowing pot belt stove in the middle of the small room. We took a table near the stove and as soon we were all warm and full, ready to attack the world. Tony also continued to work 
on my musical education, which had started a few years back. A high point was when we all went to hear Stravinsky Rake's Progress, an opera I had loved for that moment. Nadia Boulanger and Stravinsky were there. It was a festive occasion. We didn't have enough money to go to many concerts, even though things in Paris were quite cheap at that time. But for birthday present, Ruth gave me a ticket to Magic Flute. The title sounded much better in French. All the posters said La Flute Enchanté. It is an opera that has a strong emotional effect on me. Nothing could be that beautiful. Ma and Pa came through for a brief visit which produced great bustle to get the right wine, and a dinner required great preparation. Marguerite outdid herself. Afterwards, she, as she often did, felt compelled to comment on our guests. If they were American, not much was said, but my parents were different. She was particularly taken by the mother, by my mother. And the next day, she pronounced the ultimate compliment. She told Ruth that Madame est une grande dame. One evening, we invited the Faré Fremier and Madame's sister. When we told Marguerite she was in a state, the guests were French. She would not let Ruth do any of the shopping. She decided we were to have a duck, and she went to the market, and so far as I could determine, spent some time squeezing all the ducks there to get just the right one for the particular dish she had in mind. The dinner was super bad, uh, bad to be done in a French fashion with succession. It had to be done in French fashion in a succession of separate courses. We didn't have enough plates and uh, Sylvia were, so we had to hire concierge to wash dishes non-stop between courses. After dinner, Madame Faure and her sister went into the kitchen to compliment Marguerite and give her a tip. The next day, when we were thanking Marguerite for the big success, she made it very clear in a nice way that she very much approved of our French friends. There was hope for us yet. To go to the laboratory from our apartment was about a half hour walk. Even if I took the bus, I would get off at the Luxembourg Gardens and walk through them. To this day, I can still see those beautiful spring mornings. Then the clipped chestnuts were just turning green and the thin sun barely warmed the ground. Some mornings, the gardeners would be rolling out the potted trees from their winter carters in the orangery, a process that no doubt had been carried out for the last 200 years. In the chairs by Fountain, there would be a few students getting a short drink of sun before morning of the dusty classrooms. In one corner, there was 18th century statue of a nude woman. Her figure was so exactly roots, I felt somehow should rush over and cover it. The last lap to the laboratory was down to the somewhat severe Rue de Col and then into a grilled courtyard of the Collège de France. Every day I was aware of the plague on the corner of the building that said this was the laboratory 
of Claude Bernard, and if I missed that, his statue was out from front facing the lodging house where he spent his later years. I never heard an outsider give a lecture in physiology at Collège de France without saying what a privilege it was to give a lecture in the institution of Bernard. His presence was almost felt. There were also the names of other famous scholars inscribed on the walls, but more poignant were the names of the professors and the assistants who were killed during the Second World War. I no longer remember the names, but some of them were women, and under the name of one was tortured and killed in Auschwitz. I met a number of distinguished scientists, many of them introduced to me by Fauré. He particularly wanted me to meet his old student, Boris Efrusi. I had heard that Efrusi was rather a difficult and domineering person, but I thought I might be safe if I went with his old teacher. I soon found out how wrong I was. Efrusi's English was better than mine, but I suppose in a Deference to Monsieur Faure, the attack took place in French. I had just published Morphogenesis. His first question after a polite handshake was what did I think might be the answer to a problem of morphogenesis? I had spent a whole book trying to answer the question in English and the idea of giving him a sensible answer in a paragraph in French was not likely to happen, as the both knew. He flattened me in the first round. Later he came to Princeton, and we had some very reasonable, slightly edgy conversation. The only person who did the identical thing to me quite a few years later was Max Delbruck, an equally distinguished biologist who was one of the important contributors to the beginning of molecular genetics. I was able to handle that a bit better. I had been through it all before. How to rattle someone in the beginning of the conversation so that the top dog can be quickly established. I was also introduced to another remarkable group from the Pasteur Institute, an informal seminar including Efrusi and a number of others, met periodically in the late afternoon to discuss modern problems in the development of biology. It included Jacques Manot and André Lvov, who, along with François Jacob, did so much to further our understanding of the way gene activity is controlled in bacteria and viruses. Particularly important was the discovery of how the activity of the gene is controlled in the bacterium, E. coli. They were major players in the beginning of molecular biology for which all three shared the Nobel Prize. As I look back on the seminars in 1953, I realized that already those first-rate people were plotting the molecular revolution. I was intrigued by what they were doing and were reporting at the seminars, but I felt at the time that there was a great gap between their studies on gene action and my more global interest how an animal or a plant develops. Over the years, the gap is slowly narrowing, but at the time, their vision into the future was extraordinary prescient. In that group, the person with whom I felt the greatest affinity was Andrei Wolf, who was the head of that 
particular Pasteur Institute laboratory. This was partly because he had written an excellent book jointly with his professor, which I had read previously, on the development of ciliates. It was totally biological in its content and full of interesting ideas on how the structure of the elaborate cortex was inherited from the generation to the next. I decided to call on him and the Pasteur Institute, but unfortunately he was not in, so I left a note saying I would very much like to meet him and left a copy of my book. Very soon afterwards, he telephoned me to say that he had not known that I had produced such a major work and he would be delighted to see me. He stopped almost in a mid-sentence, however, and asked, Where did you learn to speak French? I suddenly realized I am talking to an American who can speak French. I told him about my Swiss background, but warned him that soon he would see cracks in my syntax, that I would try hard to conceal my speaking in the short sentences. That deficiency because all too evident when I gave lecture in French. I cannot read a lecture to an audience because I had never been any good reading out loud, even my own sentences. I lectured twice, and both times was an effort. I felt as though I had been engaged in one man wrestling match. After a very formal lecture at the Collège de France, my friends in the laboratory came rushing up to tell me all the mistakes I had made in my French. They told me I should not despair. Some of them were very funny. The group at the Pasteur Institute and Efrusi and Faure seemed so different from many of the other scientists that I encountered in France that year. They were along with some of the older, more established biologists met through Monsieur Faure, international scientists who kept in active touch with what was going on in other countries. They were very much in the forefront. I spent even more time with younger people in the laboratory who were closer to my age, and some of them became good friends. It was surprising to me at the time how insular they were. They kept in close touch with French science and the French journals, but they paid much less heed to what was going on elsewhere. No doubt, part of it was a language barrier, and perhaps part of it was indoctrination at school. Surely that is no longer the case. What with English becoming the universal language of science? In France today there is an increased awareness that science has little interest in borders. As I look back on those months in Paris, I have nothing but pleasant memories, although I know all was not smooth. One big political event that gripped us all to the bone was the execution of Rosenbergs for espionage back home. I found out later that most people in America felt they were guilty and should be executed, but in Europe in general and in France in particular there was a very strong feeling of sufficient doubt of their guilt, so that their lives should be spared. It was the first time I realized that a country could be whipped, whipped up into passion on the particular point of view, one quite different 
from the feelings of those in another country, all based on the same facts. We were genuinely upset as the date of execution approached, as were all our French and American friends. All over Paris there were huge posters with a cartoon of President Eisenhower grinning and each one of his teeth was electric chair. There was a very nice young man in the laboratory who decided to make up a petition that we would all sign and he would take it to American Embassy. He did the rounds and was going to take a petition in after work. Suddenly, at the very end of the afternoon, Monsieur Faure came into my room and explained that he was collecting signatures all over again, had persuaded the nice young man whom he described as a chick type, which is roughly equivalent to nice guy, that this was in the best interest of Rosenbergs. Faure explained to me that since our friend was communist, as of course we all knew, the previous petition would do more harm than good. Naturally, I signed again and Monsieur Faure rushed out to get a taxi to take it to the embassy. We didn't save the Rosenbergs, but all the respect for Monsieur Faure went up yet another notch. When I returned to Princeton, I began to ask myself questions such as why do we have development at all? Why go to all the, that bother of starting at a single cell in the form of fertilized egg and each generation constructing a large complex adult? Would it not be easier for elephant to simply split in two and the the front half regenerate a new posterior and vice versa. Some worms can do this, but they also have a complete life cycle that starts with fertilized egg. It slowly dawned on me that this was something that had arisen and was maintained by Darwinian natural selection. To compete successfully, there must be inherited variations, and sexual reproduction is the effective way of handling and disseminating that variation. In multicellular organisms, all the genes of all the cells are the same. Each cell has the complete complement of the organism's genes. In every generation, there is the mixture of genes of the two parents, and this can only be achieved by the fusion of one cell from the father, sperm, and one from the mother, egg, to form the new offspring. In other words, in each generation, there must be a single cell stage for sexual reproduction to take place. It is interesting that even asexual organisms, which include many algae and fungi, and some invertebrates, also commonly have a single cell stage in their life history. The advantage there seem to be largely for dispersal. Small single cell asexual spores can effectively be spread by the wind and other agents. We also know that there has been, over the course of evolution, a selection for size increase under many ecological circumstances, a large organism will have an advantage in the competition for resources over a small one. So natural selection is simultaneously favoring a very small stage for managing heredity or dispersal and very large stage for effectively competing for energy in the form of food. This led me to an important conclusion about the life cycle, that development was inevitable result of sex and size. The life cycle was framed by those twin pressures of natural selection. Obviously, those ideas were a direct 
outcome of my fixation with life cycles. Slime molds, ciliates, algae, insects, human beings, we all we are all life cycles. It's not just the adult that evolves through natural selection, but the entire cycle. We are so naturally inclined to think of ourselves as adults that we neglect the fact that we begin our development as a single fertilized egg. We automatically think of an individual as an entirety that exists in a moment in time, a snapshot, when it exists in particular shape. In human beings, that moment could be when we see a fetus or when we see an old woman. However, that is a trick our brain plays on, it, on us. From the point of view of evolution, an individual is a life cycle. Natural selection uh, cools or encourages every stage of our lifespan. In fact, the only way to change the adult is to make change in some earlier period of development of the life cycle. Just at the time in 1956, that uh, some of those thoughts were taking shape in my mind. I received invitation from uh, G. P. Wells to give a course of three lectures at University College in London. I was excited and pleased and immediately began to put some of those grand thoughts together in the form of lectures. I had written up main ideas and now rewrote them completely. The whole event was a big moment for me. I felt as though it was finally coming into full bloom, but at the same time was terrified. This was not helped by the fact that I took the train from Princeton to New York to go to airport, the train came to what seemed like a permanent stop when the drawbridge over the Hackensack River was stuck and the tracks could not be lined up properly. After an agonizing delay, we finally got through and I just caught my flight. University College put me up at the Siba Foundation on Portland Place, which was supported by a Swiss pharmaceutical company. There were a number of other scientists from all of our guests and at one memorable breakfast, Englishman appeared, scowling at everyone. He surveyed all the beautiful Swiss gems and said in furious tone, no marmalade, hardly an English breakfast. I had splendid reunions with Claire and Justin Lavinsky, who had spent the war with us as a refugee children and were now grown up and the rest of their family and brain Brian Schaeffer from Cambridge, a good friend whose work on slime molds I particularly admired. Among other things, he was the first to isolate the chemical that attracted amoeba. I could hardly believe it. The very first evening the Siba Foundation put on a dinner for me, after which he gave a lecture on my recent work on slime molds, that was chaired by Peter Medovar, and there were other distinguished biologists there whom I knew only by name. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. I felt like a debutant, and the main show had not yet started. The day before the first lecture was so nervous that I decided it might be wise to go to see a play or a film for therapeutic distraction. I found that Agatha Christie's mousetrap had a meeting, the perfect medicine. It had already been running for years. I was the only man in the audience and an intermission tea was served. 
I was totally distracted. The first lecture was even more terrifying than I thought possible. I was not allowed to just enter lecture room, but was marched there by the most magnificent beadle, all dressed in a light blue uniform. Rafael liked the doorman at a very fancy hotel. He carried a huge maze so that preceded to the lecture hall, was convinced was marching in my own funeral procession. We went to the podium where I sat next to Jeep Wells, who introduced me. Large lecture hall was full. In the front rows were people well known to me and whom I had just met. In the front row, could see a star among neurobiologists, J. Z. Young, and not far from him, the famous geneticist J. B. S. Haldane, who positively glowered at me. How I got through the lecture, I will never know. Just afterwards, rushed to the Gents, as was washing my hands, Heldane, who was next to me, said in his booming voice, Bonner, we don't make jokes in our lectures in this country. This did nothing to calm me down, but I did manage to say, those weren't jokes, I was just nervous. I had no idea how the first lecture was received. And walking down the street the next day, ran into J. Z. Young, who greeted me with his charming smile and inquired, Well, John, what do you think of your lecture? I always thought that was a splendid ploy. Later one evening, we went to a series of pubs drinking beer. And while he never said so, he made me feel that my lectures were not a disaster. The same was true for Heldane, and he insisted I come to dinner with him and his wife, Helen Sparway. They both loved to shock and they loved to argue. Helen had just been arrested for misdemeanor involving someone else's dog. I forget the details, but it was in all the newspapers, and she was reveling in it, and the principle she upheld, whatever that might have been. We went to a small restaurant in Soho. We went to a small restaurant in Soho, and soon were embroiled in some very spirited arguments. One was about some biological aspect of sex. Mostly, they argued with one another. Both of them had very penetrating voices as they become more intense, with the result that all the people on the neighboring tables were staring at us. Even though the both appeared to ignore the stir they were causing, I could not help feeling they not only were aware of it, but enjoyed the seeing the shock waves travel across the room. By the time we left the restaurant, we were on the recent work in animal behavior and its evolutionary implications. It was a subject of concern to all three of us. And indeed, it was the central theme of uh, one of the lectures, where I drew parallels between behavior and development. We all had more to say, so they decided they would walk me to Portland Place, but we still had not finished, so I walked them back toward University College. The whole process repeated itself again before we were ready for bed. On one of the laps, we passed the BBC building and on the ground floor, a low window was opened 
at the top and one could hear radio blaring away. Helden was talking and suddenly he veered across the broad sidewalk, stood on the toes, shoved his enormous head into the open window, yelled with tremendous force, shut up. He went directly on to his next sentence. As uh, he cruised back alongside as without skipping a bit, I got an impression he didn't like the BBC and I always wondered what might have been the sensations of the people working in the room. As a result of that evening and some subsequent meetings during my visit, we began a sporadic correspondence. It was mainly from India, where he and uh, Helen Sparway went to live. He seemed to enjoy living in India, although he could be as difficult with his new Indian friends as he was with the people he left. I asked him once why he had left Britain, and he said, looking at me as a thaw, I did not exist. Because there are too many damned Americans here, especially damned American soldiers. There probably were, but I don't think that was the reason at all. I think there was a, quite a bit of the Hindu Brahmin in his nature, and he found some peace there for his turbulent mind. I still have our letters, which span the years from 1959 to 1962. As I read them, I am impressed all over again with how fertile his mind was. Uh, he could look at any biological problem with fresh, ingenious insights. He was also not encumbered with a need to flatter. In the early 1960s, I had sent him a book that had written for the layman the ideas of biology. Here are some fragments of his replies. November 15, 1960. Dear Bonner, you ask about Helen and me coming to Princeton. This is at present impossible for me. I was asked by your government to give a list of all associations to which I had belonged since my 16th birthday in 1908, with date of joining and leaving, with the threat of jail or fine if I get one wrong. I don't know if I join the Oxford University Liberal Club in 1912 or 1913. Having a professional regard for truth I am not going to guess. If President Kennedy has the guts to tear down this iron curtain, I will come when next asked, if I can manage. But I think there are too many officials who have a vested interest in that sort of nonsense. So you had better come here. There are plenty of molds especially in the monsoon, Fre February 14, 1962. Dear Bonner, every 15 years or so, I write a paranoic paper. In 1919, I gave the dimensions of a gene and several other things about genes, not wholly wrong, on very inadequate evidence. In 1928, I gave the general accepted theory of anaerobic origin of life. I hope Nagy has busted. In 1944 I produced a cosmological speculation which nobody likes, not even myself. Perhaps it's right. September 25, 1962. Dear Bonner, thank you for the ideas of biology. I have not yet read it, but my first impression is that 
you have made number of statements sometimes for the first time sufficiently clearly to allow destructive criticism for example on page 29 then he makes five detailed points all excellent the last one concerning page 152 the book is only little over 200 pages anyway the book is provocative probably more so than you meant it to be i kept wondering what he might have said had he admitted to reading the book after giving those uh, 1956 lectures i had an uh, invitation uh, to spend the weekend with victor rothschild well known for his work on fertilization whom i knew slightly and his family in Cambridge. It was the first time I had seen Cambridge, and I was quite bowled over by its beauty. Both Victor and his wife Tess could not have been kinder, and they had a wonderful time. I had previously sent the manuscript of my lectures to Cambridge University Press, and they had given me very an encouraging reply. Victor asked about it. I told him the details. He got up, said, wait a bit, disappeared into his study, could hear him distantly on the telephone, and he came back to say that it was all settled. They would publish my book. Victor had not even read it. What could he have possibly said over the telephone, and to whom? Of course, I never knew, but they did publish the evolution of development. Since then, I have always wished that whenever I finish the book, there would be a Lord Rothschild about to speed it on its way. Even my departure from London after those uh, whirlwind two weeks was an event. On the night departure, Ruth Lovinsky, mother of Claire and Justin, who had stayed with us as refugee children during the war, invited me to a family dinner. She was a celebrated cook, and that evening she outdid herself. The food and the wine were a dream. I kept worrying about catching the plane, as I always do, but Justin said, he would drive me out in plenty of time. We started very late, and by the time we got there, almost everyone had boarded. All the regular seats were filled, so they had to put me in a first class. One of the other passengers was Maria Callas in her splendid elegance. The pretty stewardess came to me and said, that having been apt first class, I was to have a steak dinner with champagne. I explained to her that I had just come from spontaneous dinner and could not do it. She was very upset because I was passing up the chance to have a fantastic meal and free too. I rode home among the clouds. Five years after my first leave in France, I was again in 1958, given a semester off, needed to apply for another fellowship. It seemed to me the most sensible thing to do was to apply for Guggenheim since I had begun my application there five years previously, but had taken Rockefeller because it had come through first. In discussing this with my older colleague Elmer Butler, he argued me not to write them, but to go in a talk directly to the president, Henry Allen Moore, who Elmer said was a person quite worth meeting. I made an appointment and went to New York to see him. He was indeed charming man, and I explained to him 
that I would again like to apply for Guggenheim Fellowship and I asked what should I do. He said with a great smile, I didn't have to do anything, I already had the fellowship. I could not quite gather in what he was telling me. So I began to explain, but he interrupted me saying, No, you are the one that doesn't understand. You are all set to go. You have a Guggenheim fellowship. I finally realized that my previous application had gone through five years earlier and then were just waiting for me to apply again. I was rendered spluttering and uh, speechless, much to the friendly amusement of Henry Ellen Moore. I felt very lucky indeed. I had wanted to go to the genetics laboratory of uh, C.H. Weddington at the University of Edinburgh. He was someone I didn't know, but greatly admired his books and his research. He was a pioneer in that he was simultaneously concerned with development, genetics and evolution, producing the very kind of synthesis between those three domains that I consider of utmost importance. He made me feel immediately welcome in his department, and while I saw quite a bit of him, and I always gained from our conversation, cannot say that I really got to know him. He was not that kind of person. There was always a distant, British, briskness about him that could hardly be described as a warmth. Yet he had a good sense of humor. I remember near the beginning uh, he took Ruth and me out to dinner at one of the fancier restaurants in Edinburgh. Our waiter was a young a uh, cockney who asked me what kind of potatoes I wanted with my sweetbreads. I apparently was slow in making up my mind, so the waiter said, I would recommend mashed with that sauce you need an absorbent potato. This was too much for Red, as we called him, and he collapsed with laughter. There were many other stimulating people in his department, so that I enjoyed myself uh, thoroughly and uh, learned many things from Ved and his colleagues. I had decided to do mainly laboratory work on slime molds, which I brought with me, and uh, Ved took a great interest in my progress. When we arrived in January, it was very cold. I noticed that everyone I had an electric fire in their office except me. So I went to the stockroom manager, asked for one, and the man said something to the effect that uh, he supposed that as a soft American, I could not take this kind of indoor temperature. I quickly said he hacked it backwards. Some Scott had stolen the heater from my room. We got along with well after that because I soon learned the Scots were kindly disposed toward Americans. We had two things going for us. They all had relatives in America and we learned English. The laboratory temperature had another good effect. The university turned the heat off at noon on Saturday and back on Monday morning, it meant all my slime molds stopped in their tracks for the weekend. They didn't resume their activities until mid-morning on Monday. We all had the weekends off. During that stay, I began to worry why so many primitive organisms, and I had small and uh, I had small colonial algae, uh, particularly in mind, have a uh, alternation of sexual and asexual generations. For instance, the colonial algae Volvox, which is a common inhabitant of our fresh wa water ponds, will have numerous asexual cycles 
that produce a series of identical colonies or clones and occasional sexual cycle that produces a thick walled resistant stage. It occurred to me that this pattern had evolved through selection because in the benign summer, when growth conditions are ideal, successful reproduction means producing as many offspring as quickly as possible. If the genetic constitution of colony was suited and could thrive in those particular summer conditions, there was no need to, wo to worry. Just duplicate oneself as rapidly as possible. In the fall, with the growing season coming to an end, and no certainty that those conditions would be the same the next spring, the safest way to ensure continuing reproductive success was to have a sexual cycle in which two genetically different individuals fused their egg and sperm and the resulting offspring that germinated come the warmth of spring would be genetically diverse and some of the variants would have an improved chance of coping with the new conditions. By this sexual asexual alternation, Volvox could have it both ways, fast reproduction in constant dependent growing condition and variable offspring uh, to meet any change in the future environment. The chair I sat in while writing this paper, had a little plate on the arm saying, donated by L.C. Dunn. He was a distinguished geneticist at Columbia University, editor of the American Naturalist, very journal had intended to send the paper to. In my covering letter with the manuscript, I said that I had written the paper sitting in a dance chair and this spirit surely would make the paper acceptable to his journal. He sent me amusing reply in which he said that when he had visited the genetics laboratory many years previously, the chairs were so uncomfortable that in a fury he went off and bought one. The then head, Professor Crewe, was much amused and had a plague put on. My paper was published. There was an eyeful of a young woman who washed everyone's dishes and as soon heard that she had a reputation for being too friendly. I could see why, because she looked quite irresistible. Like every other man, I would linger for a chat uh, when I was delivering or picking up my glass for, and we often discuss grey hound races to which she was addicted. One day I arrived with a big basket of dishes, and before I had a chance to say anything, she fixed me with those serene eyes and said, let's go to the dogs together. I nearly dropped my whole basket, but then I realized she was talking about something other than what I first thought and recovered. I'm sorry to say I never went to the dogs with her. Scotland always had and always will have a magic for me. It started in my early years when my family spent a few summers there and it was strongly reinforced that year in Edinburgh. There is something about the brisk air, the green of the hills and the fields, the uh, heather and the bracken, the burns and the rivers, the lapwings and the uh, curlews and uh, skylarks and the robins that steers me deeply. 
I even like the occasionally paralyzing cold, the soaking rain showers, and the changing sky. I have a special feeling for small towns with the dark stone of their severe houses. Edinburgh is in a particular full of marvels from the ancient tenement houses to my favorite, the Georgian buildings of the new town. The laboratory was in the King's buildings, which are right by Blackford Hill. So in a few minutes, I could walk out into a grassy moor full of gorse in a bloom. We were lucky, and the through friends landed a very pleasant house, just a short walk from the laboratory. It had been built a few years back by a philosopher, Camp Smith, who knew who now was in a nursing home. He was happy to rent his house to someone from Princeton because he had fond memories of teaching there for a year. Being of the old school, he had not put in central heating, so we had to plot to keep it warm. For instance, I remember my electric razor became totally congealed and would not work in the morning. So the moment I woke up, I would put the razor in the bed by the hot water bottle to get it ready for action. The remarkable thing was that the children didn't seem to notice the cold and would play happily in a room that had no fire at all. Ruth and I would gather around the fire in the living room library and would be joined by Professor Smith's black Labrador who had the amazing trick of parking his car. Uh, <laughs> amazing trick of parking his rear end on one of the low chairs by the fire with the front legs in front of the floor and would then look right at me. I always suspected it is what he did with the professor. They would sit and discuss philosophy together. Oh, we made some very good friends on that visit in the Mitchinson family, whose children were roughly the same age as ours. Murdoch was in the zoology department, where he later became the professor, and Rowie was historian who also became a professor in the university. In those days, a professor in Scotland was something far more impressive than anywhere else in the world, for the Scots revere education. The Mitchinsons uh, loved to walk, as I did, and they introduced us to many splendid places that could be reached by short drives away from town. This was not so much on our first visit, but on the two subsequent leaves we took to Edinburgh and short trips in between. We could go to uh, Lammermoors, where I could get my uh, fill of a uh, heater, black face ship, grooves veering off as one flushed them from the heater. Uh, hairs racing away and the sulphur cry of curlews. Sometimes in the middle of the walk, the sky would open, but when the shower was over, one would steam a bit and then slowly dry out. And after many hours, there would be that wonderful feeling of fatigue in one legs to be rewarded by a pot of tea and some raising uh, scones and uh, shortbread. 
Sometimes we would go down to the lake district of Yorkshire to see the wild daffodils and walk to the dales. There the reward was a delicious pub dinner with splendid beer. I love walking anywhere provided it is not too hot, but the open spaces of the moors and their dales cannot be beat. That year I also did some fishing to the tweed. I would play hockey for an afternoon and go to upper reaches where the uh, trout and grayling were plentiful. The tweed valley is one of more beautiful places in the world. The river itself, the green fields hedged in, rolling hills and the low mountains in the distance. Scotland was where I had learned to fish as a boy and now was reaping the rewards. I saw hardly any other fishermen and now and then would have a fish. I will never forget the drives home with the slanting yellow evening sun lighting up, the hills uh, stud with sheep. Some images never uh, seem to dim in one's memory. Mardox Mitchinson's father and mother had a big place on the west coast of Scotland in Kintyre and they invited us for a few days in June when the rhododendron was in bloom. The drive there was spectacular and we could not have been made more welcome. Dick Mitchinson was a member of Parliament and a man of great charm. Naomi No, his wife and the sister of J.B.S. Haldane, was a well-known novelist. From Dick I learned many things about Parliament, things that had puzzled me from the reading Trollope. No, Naomi uh, had her desk behind the sofa in the bay window of a very large living room with a blazing fireplace and big windows that looked out toward the sea. She would blast away on her typewriter even then the room was full, oblivious of all the talk until she had finished. It is the kind of concentration I have always envied. Kinter is a wonderfully wild place, but the old house with its uh, turrets, its large Victorian windows and its simple furniture made one feel protected from the elements. More than that, there was a warm and lively atmosphere that came not only from the open fire in the living room, but uh, from our hosts and all the other guests. We must have been over 20 in all. Other Mitchinson young, besides Murdoch and Rowe, labor politicians, writers, artists, and sprinkling of children. We all sat around an enormous dining room table, looking out on the blooming rhododendrons. Everyone served themselves at the sideboard and sat where they could find a place. On that first visit, the cooking was done by Dick's political agent, who of course sat with us at the table and there was massive cooperative help with the clearing up. It all seemed to run very smoothly and we had a marvelous time as we did on numerous subsequent visits. Some years after Dick had died, we were there for a New Year's, which is the big celebration in Scotland. Naomi invited the whole village, as she did every year, and the whiskey flowed. There was a 
Pepper and the Fiddler for the dancing, and the din was enormous. All the young practiced reels the afternoon before. Everything and everybody glowed that night, and the dancing was perfect delight, especially watching some of the young mothers bidding their small daughters. At midnight, we all formed a ring and sang old lang sing as we danced back and forth after a lot of kissing there were two speeches the first one by the senior fisherman thanking dear naomi which he kept repeating in a slightly uh, sudden manner and then no made her gracious reply which had a moral to it uh, but Alas, I don't remember what it was. All I remember was that it was just right. The next day, we had to do visits to friends in the village. It was required that they offer us a drum, and it was required of us that we drink it. It was a grand time but we all needed a rest after it was over. One Sunday, we revisited Lennoxlov, the castle my grandfather had rented when I was a child, as a place to gather in the summer all the Swiss and American relatives. It was now owned by the Duke of Hamilton, and for a few shillings one could make a tour Then the Duke was not in it residence. It was much as I remembered in from 27 years before. I mentioned to the guide that I had lived there, and he clearly thought I was an American nut. So, happened I was wearing a tweed jacket my father had discarded, and remembered we had a photograph of him by the front door in that very jacket. So, Ruth took a snapshot of me standing in the same place with the same jacket. The result was interesting. I was not wearing the long gun plus uh, force that went with the jacket and generally looked rather like an intellectual bomb. My father, however, looked like somebody straight out of Evelyn Vaux. That first stay in Scotland in 1958 was the only time I was tempted to leave Princeton. One day, uh, Michael Swan, who was then the professor of zoology and later vice-principal of the university, came to see me at the house to tell me that the chair of botany was vacated and asked if I would apply. I was bowled over. The idea of spending the rest of our lives in Scotland was fundamentally appealing not only to myself, Ruth and the children seemed to feel the same way. However, I had to give the idea some serious thought and begged Michael for time. I knew quite well I was just applying and that there might be stronger applicants, yet here seemed a wonderful opportunity. I discussed the pros and contras uh, endlessly with Marduk and wrote my parents and colleagues in Princeton for advice. My parents said, do it by all means, but the letters from Princeton showed gratifying horror. In fact, Princeton immediately promoted me to full professor which made the decision all the more difficult, and I finally decided that I should go back to the United States. We had been happy at Princeton. It seemed a better bet uh, for my work, and there were more unknowns in Edinburgh. Later, I would now and then ask myself whether I had made the right decision, and I always came to the conclusion that I had, simply because things worked out 
so well for me in Princeton, I became doubly convinced when Mrs. Thatcher started stranding British universities. We completed reading of chapter 3.